Welcome to the Sisterhood of Sweat. I am here today with Esther Blum. Esther is the best-selling author of Cave Women Don't Get Fat, Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous, Secrets of Gorgeous, and the Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous Project. She currently maintains a busy virtual practice where she helps women balance hormones, lose stubborn body fat, and treat the cause of health struggles. Esther was voted best nutritionist by Manhattan Magazine. And she has appeared on Dr. Oz, The Today Show, A Healthy You with Carol Alt, The Isaac Show, ABC TV, Fox 5's Good Day New York, and Fox News Live. Esther is an in-demand Authority frequently quoted in E Online, In Touch, Time Magazine, The New York Post, The Los Angeles Times, In Style, Bazaar, Self, Fitness, Marie Claire, and Cosmo. Esther received a Bachelor of Science in Clinical Nutrition from Simons College in Boston and is a graduate of New York University, where she reserved her where she received, sorry, I'm stumbling over my word here today, where she received her Master of Science in Clinical Nutrition. Esther is credentialed as a registered dietitian, a certified dietitian nutritionist, and a certified nutrition specialist, CNS. The certification from the Board for Certification of Nutrition Specialists, BCNS. She is also a member of the American Dietetic Association, Dietitians in Functional Medicine, Nutritionists in Complementary Care, and the Connecticut Dietetic Association. Today was so great with Esther. If you guys listened to the previous episode, that was amazing. And we covered more topics today about menopause, postmenopause just adrenal fatigue and hormone imbalances, how to fix our gut, fix our sleep, get rid of menopause, uh, so many issues that we can have as we start to age, what to do when we feel like our skin is starting to look like old skin and it's not being like resilient Uh, Maybe we feel like our hair is dry, our skin is dry. So many solutions today. What type of tests we need to ask our doctor for to test for everything so we can make sure everything in our bodies are optimally working. How to intermittent fast, detox. What type of exercises to be doing in menopause and how Our bodies are changing, so we need to make changes. We also talked about hormone replacement therapy, bioidentical hormones, uh, how to, if we don't want to do either one of those, how to be naturally supplementing, and so much more. Uh, Last but not least, we talked about minimizing stress. This was so well-rounded, and Esther, as you can tell when you listen today, is the expert. She knows her stuff, so you're going to benefit from all of her expertise today, and we hope we brought you some solutions for any hot flashes, a lack of sleep, and libido that you may be having. So without further ado, let's dive in with the one, the only, Esther Blum. It is so good to have Esther back on the show today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm stoked to be here. Well, what have you been up to since the last time you were on? I know you have a new book. Can you tell us about it? Yes, Linda. Yes. This book I wrote poured out of me. It was like the divine cosmos just channeling right through. Um, It's called See You Later Ovulator, Mastering Menopause Through Nutrition, Hormones, and Self-Advocacy. And this book came from all the women in my practice who are not getting the care they need through menopause, who need a voice 
who need an advocate and who need to understand the path to treatment. They need to know their rights as a patient in a doctor's office, and they need to understand specific treatment options to enhance their quality of life. So this book, I opened the kimono on my practice. I was like, I'm going to teach you exactly how I treat people and the kind of treatments that you can get for yourself that are available so you can hit the ground running. And I love the topic, of course, because I think I went through, you know, I went through menopause and I learned some things the hard way. And so now I've done a lot of studying and taken a lot of courses so that I, in addition, could help women get through menopause a lot easier. And I found some secrets that I think, you know, are worth the share. So I'm so excited to hear all about what you discovered and how we can help each and every woman out there to go through menopause like a rock star. So what are your tips for our women out there so they can breeze through menopause like a rock star instead of feel like uh, they're beating their head against a wall? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's, let's just put a little historical perspective on this. So most of the women who I'm treating in practice and who I'm seeing are coming to me with, and you can probably speak to this too on some level, right? Of, you know, insomnia, hot flashes, depression, anxiety, bloating, indigestion, maybe some reflux, um, irritability, moodiness, um, a decline in muscle mass, um, an increase in brain fog, all of these things, uh, vaginal dryness, low libido, not all of these things affect all women, but most women go through some symptoms of some sort when they're going through menopause or per through the stages of perimenopause into menopause, which is when you completely stop having a period for 12 months or more. Um, and so what happens is they're going to the doctors, they're listing off all the symptoms and doctors, be it male or female, often say, well, it's just menopause. That's, oh yeah, that's just menopause. As, and then are sent home without solutions. Or I hear from my patients, you know, oh yeah, my doctor told me to go on the pill. My doctor gave me antidepressants, which antidepressants can stop hot flashes, but are not going to fix root cause issues. Um, and certainly won't fix gut or adrenal issues. Uh, or they're put on the IUD. My favorite story was from one of my clients whose doctor said, oh yeah, I just take Benadryl shots every night. So no, nothing in sight, no solutions in sight. And so, and there's a lot of fear around hormone replenishment therapy or hormone replacement therapy or menopausal hormone replacement, however you want to, uh, there's many proper terms out there, but the bottom line is that the guidelines for menopause were initially set and, and hormone replacement in particular were set um, or derived from a study called the Women's Health Initiative, where urine of pregnant horses uh, was the base of hormone replacement and women were thought to develop cancer after that. They were thought to have increased risk of cancer, blood clots, heart disease, all these really disconcerting uh, you know, side effects from the medication. Well, A, if you think about it and you don't really have to think about if you're a woman, if you're scratching your head and like shaking your head right now saying this is ridiculous, it is ridiculous because that is not biocompatible with our own physiology, okay? So just take that in mind. In 2018, the um, North American Menopause Society reversed their statement and said, oopsie, the data really did not point to an association with cancer. And in fact, hormone replenishment can be associated with a decrease in the risk of Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, and heart disease. Oh, and by the way, it's safe for long-term use. So the problem is, is that uh, most medical offices and doctors are not aware of this updated information, even though we, we're recording this in 2022, that is a four year, that's already four years that doctors have not updated their recommendations. So I'm here to say not only are hormones in a very important, they're not the only piece, you cannot out hormone poor lifestyle choices 
or, uh, you know, over exercising or under sleeping or over dieting, right? Or under dieting, but with a, when coupled with lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, maybe some supplements, good, good diet, um, hormones are really an amazing part, can be amazing part of menopause. And they can also be started in perimenopause. You don't have to wait so that you can have an easier transition into menopause. So what are some of the mistakes that you see women commonly making in their diets and their exercise routines when they hit menopause and perhaps they get a menopause their body starts changing and they freak out? So the first thing I see is a restriction in calories and food um, and an increase in exercise. People think, oh my God, I wake up, you know, the, the weight gain comes on quick. It comes on often in the midsection um, due to, you know, higher cortisol levels, poor blood sugar regulation. That happens with a decline in estrogen and progesterone. So you may think I have not changed a darn thing on my eating and yet I'm 10 pounds heavier. I feel you on that. I definitely see that in myself too, where things are kind of shifting and I'm like, huh, I don't understand, but I do understand of course. But, um, you know, restricting your calories is not the answer. Changing the composition of your calories is definitely helpful. And so when you're more insulin resistant, you want to time out your carbs properly. I, I'm not saying you have to go super duper low carbs, but you wanna make sure that your protein is actually higher than your carbs. So if you track your food on any of the you know, tracking apps, you'll be able to see, let's say you are eating you know, 130 grams of protein, you're gonna want your carbs to be 100, 110, you know, just so the protein outweighs your carb intake. That will stabilize your blood sugar. Protein raises your serotonin and dopamine. Um, so it offsets cravings, it controls your hunger, it shuts off your appetite. No, nobody binges out on a steak, but people can eat a whole sleeve of Oreos, right? So <laughs> protein yeah. stabilizes your blood sugar. Um, and it will also help improve your body composition. It will help you build lean muscle mass. If you are not eating enough protein, but you're working out and lifting, you're only getting half the equation in because we are at risk for sarcopenia during menopause, which is age-related muscle loss. And so the way to offset that is to eat optimal amounts of protein and swap that out with carbs. Um, the other thing I tell my menopausal mamas to do is time their carbs, right? Either have them around the time of a workout, which is very helpful. That's when you're the most insulin sensitive, but also you can have carbs at night to help you sleep. And people say, well, I can't eat carbs at night. That's going to mess with my blood sugar. Eating carbs at night raises your insulin. And when that happens, it lowers your cortisol. When your cortisol is high, that's when you're going to get that. That's menopause. perfect. Yeah. So you really do want to actually have some carbs at night. So you switch the timing of that. Um, the other thing I see people doing is increasing their cardio and they're so exhausted. I'm, I'm thinking my client, Hillary came to me and she would take all these Peloton classes on her bike in the morning. And then she'd be like, yeah, I feel like I'm going to conquer the world. And then by three, she was like weepy with exhaustion, would have a Starbucks. And then she would sleep very poorly and be hot flashing all night because caffeine is a hot flash trigger. And then she'd be exhausted and the cycle would start all over again. And I was like, Hillary, you need to do more walking and you need to lift weights. She worked with a trainer. I was like, just work with your trainer, just cut down on the cardio. If you're going to do it, do it shorter duration, a couple of intense sprints, you're done. Just walk the rest of the time, which again, lowers your cortisol and do strength training to build muscle and reverse some of that insulin resistance. And so walking shifts, lowers your cortisol, you said. Walking lowers your cortisol. It's kind of a stress reliever. It is. And it burns fat and you don't need any special equipment and you can do it anytime or day or night. And you can do it indoors, outdoors. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful, underrated exercise. 
What does your exercise routine look like, Esther? Mm, so I am so grateful to say that I can finally reincorporate strength training and not die after years. I am coming, I am still in treatment for Lyme and mold, um, which had me, I completely lost the ability to lift for years or to do any kind of exercise, any kind of cardio other than walking or yoga or hiking. But if I did anything else, I crashed. I had to take a nap. I remember I was visiting my mother-in-law in Florida on vacation. I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna hit the gym. I lifted, I think I was lifting between four and 10 pound weights, nothing crazy. I came upstairs, I laid on her couch and immediately passed out for an hour. And I felt nauseous for two days after. Like I literally had no cortisol, I was rock bottom. So now that I've been treated for Lyme and mold, and we're, we just retested my mold levels, I'm so excited, but I feel my cortisol up. I can actually, we actually bought a Peloton. So I'll do maybe a 20 minute ride. I, I walk about 60 to 90 minutes a day, but in the morning I'll do like a 20 minute ride. And then I do a strength class. So I do Pilates, I do bar, I do weights. And I don't crash. So I couldn't be more grateful because I am trying to rebuild my muscle that I lost. I definitely see a change in my body composition, especially my lower body. I lost, you know, I used to, I ran, I did a marathon, I lifted. So my legs were like really strong and muscular. So I'm looking forward to getting that back. That's amazing. So yeah. you're on the men, which is, uh, we have bounce back power. Yes. We just have to, <laughs> thank goodness, yes, just thank have goodness. to figure it out. And that's yeah. what we're here for today. Uh, with natural, like let's go natural first. Uh, what type of supplements can women take that are natural, not gonna have very many side effects that, that they you know could maybe help them with? Uh, the bloating, the hot flashes, all the stuff. So there is a root called maca. It's M-A-C-A. -A. Maca is a really nice overall tonic for menopause. It helps with hot flashes. It supports your adrenals. Why is it important to support your adrenals? Because in menopause, there is a huge shift from your with your hormone production. It shifts from your ovaries. Your ovaries are like, night, night. I'm taking like the long nap. I'm not waking back up again. Okay. And then the, the rest of your hormone production, even if it's minuscule shoots stems from your adrenal glands. So maca really supports your adrenal glands, um, helps optimize your production of hormones. Um, but also is great for energy, sleep, libido. It's a, it's a very nice overall tonic. Um, if you're still, if you're kind of in the perimenopausal phase, uh, I do recommend Chase Tree, which is Vitex. That can help make your progesterone production as robust as possible to offset your estrogen. So often in perimenopause and especially menopause, progesterone drops. And if you think about, think about where we are in life, okay? A lot of us have teenage kids. Some of us have grandkids now. But a lot of us have teenage kids and aging parents. So we are totally sandwiched in there. That is me, totally sandwiched in there. And so your stress gets really, can be really high. And when your stress is very high, progesterone really can bottom out. So you become relatively estrogen dominant. So Vitex or Chase Tree can kind of help boost your progesterone. Um, black cohosh, vitamin E, primrose oil, rhubarb extract, all of those are amazing for helping hot flashes and quelling. But here's the cool thing is that when I work with women, right, I treat gut health and I treat hormones because I make sure that I need to make sure that you are detoxing your estrogen properly. And some of that happens in the gut, right? So uh, where was I going with this? Okay. Healthy gut, uh, Detoxing estrogen. Oh, I just lost my train of thought about why I test the gut. But what was your question again? I apologize. It's okay. Just I, the, the supplements that can help women yes, with yes, all yes, of their yes. symptoms. 
Yes. Well, optimizing your gut health, definitely. Oh, this is what I was going to say. I have a patient who I'm treating who we didn't even address her hormone issues yet because her gut was such a mess. And we just needed her to start detoxing estrogen in the gut first and cleaning out our parasites and pathogens. So I put her on some, some good quality fiber. And by the way, flax and chia seeds are great quality fiber that bind excess estrogens and pull them out. Um, and we put her in some digestive enzymes and some probiotics and also like a broad spectrum, natural antibacterial herbs. That alone got rid of her hot flashes. I put her on nothing to support her hormones. So fixing your gut, the healthier your gut is going into menopause, the healthier, your, the easier your transition into menopause will be. Because if you start hormone replenishment and your gut is not healthy, you are going to feel worse. You will feel side effects feel more fatigue. You can feel breast tenderness. Your insomnia can worsen. It won't help your hot flashes as much. So you really have to make sure that the hormones you do put in and or nutrients that they move through. They're not stagnant. If you're not pooping every day, if you're constipated, that's another red flag where you should wait to start hormone replacement until you are pooping every day because you need to poop every day to detox your hormones and get them <laughs> out of your system. So what you put in must come out. What you produce must come out. So that takes place in the gut, takes place in the liver, right? Sweating, that's another great way to detox, but pooping and peeing is the primary way for hormones to leave the body. And that, that yeah, the process of elimination. Yeah. And what about the liver? The uh, liver mm -hmm. being clean, you know, make sure you're, keeping your liver clean, cleaned off so that yes. all the hormones don't just kind of congest in there. Yes. And about 30% of women in menopause develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, you know, you, and that's just a process of declining estrogen and progesterone. So you want to make sure that you are cleaning up a fatty liver. Okay. So booze, booze is especially problematic in menopause. It can, a, it triggers hot flashes. It really disrupts sleep. It can slow down thyroid function and impair the burning of body fat, which is kind of important if you want to look lean and gorgeous. So um, you want to support your liver, first of all, with brassica vegetables, because these help uh, estrogen be excreted from the body. So things like broccoli, cauliflower, radishes are actually a brassica vegetable, Brussels sprouts. Um, but I also love, you know, uh, artichokes, spinach, kale. Don't hate me, carnivore diet people. I know you hate kale, but, you know, <laughs> dark green leafies um, are also really important. Cabbage, you know, all of these vitamins, uh, nutrient rich vegetables really help detox and support liver function. You also want to make sure that you're not overdoing your fat. And I'm a big proponent of eating fat, but it's got to be good quality fat. If you do have a fatty liver, coconut and olive oil are easiest on the liver. Coconut actually bypasses the liver for absorption and olive oil is very gentle on the liver. So no fried foods or canola oil, um, which are going to make you feel really, really unhealthy uh, and, and pro-inflammatory actually. So so we t you're talking a lot about taking excess uh, estrogen and hormones out of the body. So one would think that you're losing all of it, but you're not necessarily, so you're saying we may be storing some of it, but not where we want it. Well, you can be detoxing it proper, uh, improperly. So I look at labs of, I do a lot of testing in my practice, but one of the tests I do, it's called the Dutch complete. It's a urine test, a Dutch stands for dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. And that looks at all the pathways that your hormones go down, right? So is it, are they not being detoxed in your liver? Are they not moving through your gut? And you can have postmenopausal levels of estrogen that is still, I look at the ratios of the 2-OH, the 4-OH, the 16-OH forms of estrogen. You can still have improper ratios of estrogen. Your 4-OH or 16-OH can be too high relative to 
your other forms of estrogen or relative to progesterone. So you wanna make sure that those levels are balanced. So I'm all about supporting methylation pathways in the body. So you can do this with a B complex. Sometimes I need to add in like a concentrate of cruciferous vegetables that also supports phase two of liver detoxification. So it really depends on the individual. Um, I don't typically use something like DIM for postmenopausal women. That's not really indicated, but sometimes for premenopausal women, it is. Right, right, so right. That was what's really, going to be my next question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, DIM, no, not for postmenopausal women, because again, when your estrogen levels are low, you're not trying to make your level zero. You're just trying to make sure they go down the right pathway and they're not too high relative to other forms other forms of estrogen or progesterone. Now, what are some natural ways that, let's say we're postmenopausal, uh, that we could put estrogen into the body, not synthetic, but just like, I know some people drink soy milk. I take something called Purifica Makana. Like what are some of the ways we could get some estrogen from like a plant or something like that? Well, you can, I don't recommend soy um, for a form of phytoestrogen because soy really suppresses thyroid function and it's okay. really problematic. Um, yeah, I don't usually how, do it. Yeah, no. But, um, you know, there is bioidentical uh, hormone replacement therapy with uh, estrogen patches that is bioidentical. There's also biased creams. These are things that can be made in a compounding pharmacy. Um, in terms of foods, you know, yes, you, you can have, there are some foods with phytoestrogens in them, um, but typically the fastest way to replenish estrogen is with uh, replenishment, with a patch in a bioidentical form. It's just the shortest point between the two lines. And when we think about when all of the chronic, this was what amazed me when I was really researching the book seeing that and hearing lectures on and seeing the research, the published research is there that shows that degenerative diseases start 20 years before they show up. And most women are prone to Alzheimer's. Women are more prone to Alzheimer's than men. Men are more prone to heart disease until women hit menopause. Then their levels catch right up to men because the body composition changes. You go from an hourglass figure to more apple shaped, right? So um, how we distribute body fat is different and that increases cardiac risk. But uh, osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, heart disease, all of those can be offset with estrogen replacement therapy. And so that's why if you can, if you're a candidate, um, it's so beneficial. And some of you may be listening and saying, I have a huge history of family, a, a huge family history of cancer. I myself have had cancer. There are oncologists that still put their patients on hormone replenishment therapy because A, the benefits outweigh the risks. It's so protective. And B, we now know, now that somebody looked at that botched data from that one study that every doctor got their info from, that it actually is safe and protective and does not cause cancer. What in, in my theory, and from the best of my knowledge with my research, what really causes cancer is a poor detoxification of estrogen, right? If you're not detoxing it properly, that is more problematic than taking it. So get yourself- I did, the, um, I did the bioidentical hormones for- uh a pretty long time but then I got off of them yeah uh, and did more natural things like yeah the maca I, I do Anna Quebec's uh, yep. mighty maca yep I do that yep. every day I uh do the purific of Mercana for my estrogen I do the yep. um uh, I do creatine mm -hmm. uh, but not in the powder form I do something called mitochondrial NRG oh that's um, a great product for energy yes I do that mm -hmm. uh, so like I made all these changes and now I'm back to my premenopausal premenopausal body yeah um, so like I think that the time that I used the bioidenticals they they did 
well, but then it, it's like I pass over or something because mm-hmm. now I'm going to be, I'll be 60 in September. So I feel yeah. like um, I just made more natural changes. I changed my diet. I realized I didn't need to eat as much as I, I did before. Like I was a competitor. Mm-hmm. So I was always mm-hmm. eating six meals a day. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just changed it up a little. I did more plant-based uh, nutrition and no sugar whatsoever at all. Yeah. No yeah. white flour, nothing like that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I just think there's so many ways we can help ourselves, but I know some of my listeners are going to ask. So yes, is ketogenics okay for mm-hmm. them in menopause? Mm-hmm. Is that mm-hmm. beneficial or plant-based? What kind of nutrition uh, works well, you think for, for, let's just say generally for people in menopause. Yeah. Well, I have found keto can work well. Initially, it does help stop hot flashes. Um, after about three to four months, most women on it who I've worked with totally hit their wall. And that is because going too low, low carb for too long will really suppress your thyroid's conversion of T4 to T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone, which you need to burn fat. So that's why I say use carbs strategically, right? Have them around your workout, have them be whole food forms, things like vegetables, fruit, honey. If you need a post-workout carb, honey and fruit are amazing. Um, But white rice, white rice has the same carbs as brown rice. Um, So sweet potato, white potato, quinoa, Uh, butternut, acorn squash, you know, all of those whole food carbs are great. Getting rid of the processed foods and the sugars um, is really key. And also aiming for optimal amounts of protein. So how much isn't, how much should a woman be eating? Really a gram per pound of her ideal body weight is what she should be eating. So for, if you're not going to be good at converting the numbers into grams into ounces of math, you can say aim for four to six ounces of protein three times, four times a day. And so that ends up being, you know, 30 to 40 grams of protein per day, roughly uh, 50, if you're really a rock star. So it's a really simple way to do it. Because as I said earlier, like no one's overeating protein. It's really, you'll stop before you're, I mean, you'll, you'll stop when you're full. You don't, you get full quicker. It's really simple and straightforward. It, it shuts off the hunger hormones in your brain from being released in your brain. So I think those are some really simple things, but also you want to talk about lifestyle. Okay. Because lifestyle has a huge impact on your hormones and what has the most impact is what you do for your bedtime routine. Um, because most people are on the tablet or blue light or TV before bed. And when you switch to reading before bed, dim lights, some meditation, some deep, and most people say, I don't know how to meditate. All meditation is, is noticing your thoughts and returning to your breath. There is no secret, no science. Nobody knows how to do it better than you. You're not going to have a good day versus a bad day. You just breathe. You just put your lie in bed on your back, put your hands on your stomach focus on making your hands go up and down. That's really it. It's breathing into your diaphragm and your belly. Um, so yes. So really having a calming, quiet dark, uh, nighttime routine, a dark room, turn on a fan. If you're prone to hot flashes, you can sleep on a cooling mat. Can, there are all sorts of amazing like cotton cooling pajamas that you can get or pillowcases uh, that you can get as well. Um, and really prioritizing your sleep. If you sleep reigns queen over your metabolism, she is your metabolic mistress. So I don't care how much, you know, uh, supplements you're taking or hormone replacement. If you don't fix your sleep, and by the way, hormones can fix your sleep. Progesterone in particular is wonderful for getting that deep, good quality sleep. Um, but estrogen is important too. So you both in combination can really help minimize hot flashes, um, optimize your sleep and having a really good calming nighttime routine is, I mean, sleep is a very powerful nutrient in and of itself. So when we're doing all, all the above and we're having trouble sleeping, you're saying to eat some carbs at night, which I've always heard, cause it also kind of helps with your serotonin levels and all of the 
you know, brain chemicals that are going on and believe it or not, your brain also aids in your sleep. So if it's just yes. buzzing along, yes. you can't sleep because you're just laying there thinking of everything. So yes. what kind of carbs are you saying to eat at night? And I think mm -hmm. some people that have been taught low carb, low carb, low carb mm -hmm. are a no carbs at night are going to worry. Oh, am I going to gain weight because I'm eating carbs at night? You will gain more weight from not sleeping than you will from right. eating carbs at night. So again, um, beans and legumes, sweet potato, white potato, rice, quinoa, um, uh, what am I missing? Butternut squash, acorn squash, all of the hummus, chickpeas, all of those good carbs. If you want a uh, taco night, you know, I use these uh, Siete has the yeah. mm -hmm. uh, wonderful grain free tortillas which are great and delicious, but uh, often I, I do a deconstructed taco with like some refried beans and a little avocado. And then we grill shrimp or chicken, or sometimes we make like Arctic char tacos. Um, and yeah, I pile in roasted peppers. I'll put in, you know, you could do a little corn. Now corn's coming into season, just make sure it's GMO free, uh, organic corn. So any of those carbs, those are whole food carbs. I'm not telling you to slather yourself in, you know, uh, cake, cake batter and icing and donuts and bagels. That's not what I'm telling you to do. But that being said, there also is an old trick I do use that helps some people with insomnia. And that is to have a teaspoon of honey with some salt on it. And that helps reset the adrenals. Um, some people do bear with a little protein snack. Oh, like I like that. That's, mm -hmm. that's almost like I do adrenal cocktails. That's almost yes. kind of a, a quicker fix and it probably, made probably a little more tasty. It is. And you know, the other thing you can do by day is you can, in your water glass, right. You can put, um, mm -hmm. electrolytes and salt and some lemon and salt in your water restores and heals your adrenals. It was a big part of healing for me when I was recovering from mold and just where so much of us are chronically dehydrated, right? Because water gets around the, um, the outside of your cells, but the trace minerals and sodium in particular hangs out inside your cells. So you want intracellular hydration, which is true hydration. So staying really well hydrated is also an important piece of all of this. Super, super important. And I think too, uh, if we're taking enough water in, it kind of pushes out a lot of bloat that we might be having in the body because it's kind of like false fat. You could carry mm -hmm. a lot of water, right? Yes. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. It can make you look like you have love handles. If you're like a bloated gut, it's hanging out with a lot of fluid. So if you're bloated a lot too, I mean, the secret to pollution is dilution, right? So if you've got bloated gut, you know, make sure you're not carrying around some, some mold or lime or heavy metals, you know, work with a functional doctor to just see if you've got some inflammation going on, check her thyroid function, you know, all of those pieces can absolutely cause a lot of bloating. And of course, not pooping every day. And constipation, <laughs> uh, constipation is a big side effect of dehydration. So you want to make sure. Oh, oh right, right. Because when you drink more water, then it helps you eliminate. Uh, yes. yes. Um, it's just cushions your joints and yes. everything. What about, I, I have to ask this, our, our, we're in menopause, our hair is dry, mm -hmm. our skin is thirsty. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe people are noticing their skin is like, because they don't have the estrogen, all of a sudden their skin, like they're like, oh, I have old lady skin, what's going on? Yeah. What, yeah, what can yeah, we yeah. do for that? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not, believe me, I don't get any money from these companies, but bioidentical estrogen really, really, really helps with the skin and the um, maintenance of the skin. If Again, if you're not a candidate for hormones or you're hard set against them, certainly oil yourself from the inside out. You can get primrose oil. You can get high dose omega-3 oils. You can eat quality fats, things like avocados, nuts and seeds, um, butter from grass-fed cows, coconut oil. You know, you can put coconut oil right on your skin too. And there's, there's some really nice kits um, some anti-aging topicals. Dr. Hauschka makes some really good, clean, 
natural products for postmenopausal women. It's like a 28 day pack. So there's lots of things that you can do to kind of offset um, the creepiness and the dry skin. Yeah. Now we were talking earlier about the insulin sensitivity and I think women, they just, they diet way too much and then they get this mm -hmm. insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a bigger problem than we actually realize. Uh, so what is your biggest recommendation on helping someone reverse their insulin resistance? Um, I would say if you can eat optimal amounts of protein, because protein stabilizes your blood sugar for four to six hours after you eat it, but also to lift weights and lift as heavy as you can because, and throw in some intermittent fasting, I'm going to come back to intermittent fasting, but there's a great study that I love to talk about, um, where there were two control groups, group one had uh, both had diabetes type two group one took metformin and did not lift weights group two i'm sticking up my middle finger <laughs> group two <laughs> took um lifted weights but did not take metformin okay and group two the weightlifting group had better blood sugar control than just the metformin alone okay because lifting weights drives insulin into the cells it up regulates insulin sensitivity. Now, if you can do cardio within a fasted state, and I'm talking like walking or walking up hills or maybe light jogging, you know, cardio in a fasted state is a wonderful way to reset and reverse insulin resistance. So if you can do some intermittent fasting, and I'm talking start with a 12 hour fast where your last meal of the day ends at 7 p.m. and then you don't have breakfast till 7 a.m. Most people can do that fast pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then if you want to level it up a little bit, then you can do, you know, a, a 14 hour fast where your first meal of the day is until nine or 10, and then you stop eating at six or seven. And then some people only eat between the windows of 12 and eight. So, but in, intermittent fasting is another great way. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, you're cutting some calories, but giving your body long periods of time without food can be very beneficial at burning fat and resetting insulin resistance. Now, does that mean if you're listening to this, you need to run out and start doing it? See if it works for you. It's not for everybody. If you get shaky or irritable when you skip meals probably and cranky, probably not for you. If you find um, it triggers eating disorders or disordered eating, or if you have a chronic, mm -hmm. chronic health issue that you're suffering through, don't take it on. Don't put too much stress on your body. You do have to be relatively healthy to fast. But if you find that, hey, you know what? My energy is actually better when I don't eat in the morning. I don't crave food. I'm less hungry. My appetite's better regulated. I have more energy and mental focus. Then absolutely intermittent fasting is a great solution for you. And I did some prolonged fasting, which really actually helped me i feel like reset my body uh mm -hmm. it, it can boost your metabolism and i think it's kind of like a good detox it just helps you your body to focus on other things because it's not so busy with the food that you're putting in yes. Yes. and so i i love all of that we're talking about and you were talking earlier about our adrenal glands. And I think in this busy world of ours where women feel like they have to be super women and they're wearing all these different hats, and you know, you're you're taking your kids to soccer a million times a week because yeah, now yeah, they yeah. they have to go to select and they've got to be on the team, you know, and then you are going to work and you're just like taxing your adrenals so much, you yeah. don't even realize that you're you're burning them out. And wouldn't that then also affect our metabolism because your, your adrenals also affect yeah. your thyroid. And, you know, you were yeah. saying you do this honey with the salt and I know I used like an adrenal cocktail. What are some other ways that we can feed our adrenals, save mm -hmm. our adrenals and, yep. you know, help us, help us out. Yeah, well, um, first of all, getting your body exposed to natural light is a really important way to regulate your circadian rhythms and have your brain talk to your adrenals. 
um, and it regulates your stress. That the outdoor light is 200 times greater, the spectrum of natural light, 200 times brighter than any indoor bulb, especially if you're using like the um, the new bulbs that are they're not incandescent. They're like the blue light bulbs that at the energy saving bulbs. That's like really not great for your brain. So get outside. Okay, fresh air, stress management is important for adrenals. There are herbs and nutrients that I use. Um, B complex, super, super helpful for adrenal function and also for hormone detoxification. Um, adaptogenic herbs, things like rhodiola, ashwagandha, holy basil. These are all herbs that handle, that improve your body's resilience to stress. That's not to say that because you're on them, now you can keep blowing it out <laughs> and like working really hard and, and stressing yourself out. You have to take some things off your plate. You have to make a to don't list, not a to do list, a to don't list. And you're like, what the hell am I going to take off my plate? No is a very complete sentence. And we can all take one thing off our plate and say no. It doesn't make you a bad parent or a bad person. It actually makes you a good parent and a good person because if there's nothing of you left to give, it won't matter if you're there or not. You'll be, <laughs> you'll be living you know, a very poor quality of life. Um, magnesium, also really important for stress management and adrenal function. I love magnesium glycinate because that form of magnesium specifically mm. addresses anxiety. Mm, um, okay. I also love lemon balm, like at night, uh, mm -hmm. I put some, instead of alcohol, I put some extracts of lemon balm and lavender into my water and just kind of sip that with dinner. It's kind of my mocktail, my chill out drink. Um, you can also brew some uh, Yogi bedtime tea, brew two to three bags of that. That's like a natural Xanax and it'll just help you relax. So Downtime is really important for adrenals too. It's a great nutrient. And of course, protein is very restorative, but carbs are too. There's a great book by um, Dr. Alan Christensen called The Adrenal Reset Diet. Um, and he talks about, you know, carb cycling. And I write about, and see it later, ovulator, I write about the clinical research and restoring adrenal function with the use of carb cycling throughout the day, because it makes a big difference. And I definitely um, do the ashwagandha that you mentioned. I do that daily. Yeah. yeah. And it, it really helps, I think, also with your energy levels. And uh, you said the holy basil. Now, I was taking something from Organifi, and I was so sad when they discontinued it because it. I'm pretty sure it was the holy basil that was helping the way my joints were feeling. And so I don't think they're just only for stress. Maybe they helped with inflammation or something, but um, <clears throat> what is the, what does the rhodiola help with? Rhodiola is an adaptogenic herb. And so it supports adrenal function. So you want to make sure again, that your cortisol is not cortisol is like Goldilocks, right? A normal cortisol curve, you, you, you gotta get just right. Kind of peaks up right? Rising cortisol is what gets you up out of bed. So you want your cortisol to come up during the day, it peaks around noon, and then it gently falls around three. And then it just gently keeps falling till bedtime so that you can go to sleep. So a lot of people I see are either like super, super low. They're just so depleted. They've been doing too much cardio, not enough sleep, too much coffee, burning the candle at both ends, not managing their stress. Okay or caring for a sick parent or caring for a sick spouse or a sick child, or, you know, just sometimes life throws at you, uh, you know, intense circumstances. The other people I see have like super high, like their cortisol shoots all the way up off the charts by midday, and then will slowly come down, but it, and then their nighttime cortisol is peaking up again. So those people definitely need to get off coffee um, there's a, a brand, I have no affiliations with these companies, but there's a brand called Four Sigmatic. They make uh, a cacao cordyceps drink. With, it's got mm -hmm. a little ginger powder in it. Uh, it's mm -hmm. called Perform. That is, I get people off coffee and onto that. I'm instead. completely off of coffee. Yeah, me too. I, I haven't drank it in years. I gave it up completely yeah. because yeah. my energy is through the roof since I gave it up. And yes. I mean, I sleep better and my recovery is better. Yeah. And I just have, if I need a little caffeine, I'll have some green tea or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I really don't 
I don't need it like I did before. And the energy is the way I used to be when I was like in my twenties. I, I, I think people just don't realize how much it spikes your cortisol. Um, and back to something I forgot to mention was I found interesting was, uh, that creatine actually helps people to lower their cortisol. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and it helps with the recovery. And I never in a million years thought that I would ever use it because I was always like, oh gosh, it'll make me too big or, or you know, yeah. I, I, bulky or I'd worry about it. But um, I just think personally, it really helped me to maintain muscle and yeah. that's what we're losing as we yes. start to age. Yes. Yes. And so for those of you listening who are vegetarian or vegan and really struggling to meet your protein needs, but if you work out a lot, you know, creatine is, is lovely. Um, I love branch chain amino acids also. That's another great. Oh, the BCA. Yeah. BCA is, that's another great way to, to supplement and get in. Um, and certainly using some pea protein, which is a vegan protein mm -hmm. to, to bump up your protein intake. I, I usually end up using that as a bridge for people who are not getting enough dietary protein. Yeah. There's a lot of people that I have that are like, uh, how can I not be having so much animal product, so much meat, so much, you know, so I like that you're giving those suggestions yeah. because, um, they're good suggestions, you know, mm -hmm. using the the pea protein. I like using hemp, hemp seed. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's another good, it's a, it's a plant source of protein. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I sprinkle it on my salads and, uh, you know, and all sorts of things. Uh, yeah. so I, I like all these suggestions. So, uh, what type of tests before we go are the ones women should be looking for to make sure to that their hormones are balanced. And if they're not like, what kind of test do you mm -hmm. recommend they get from their doctor? Yeah. So I do in practice, I do three types of testing. Um, well, one is I recommend a full blood panel. This has to be done through a doctor. I can't order those tests, but um, I look at inflammatory markers. I look at insulin and blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C. Uh, so insulin, glucose and hemoglobin A1C. And I look at a full thyroid panel. Uh, because most doctors will prescribe TSH, which is a very poor excuse for a thyroid panel. It's just thyroid stimulating hormone. That tells me about one seventh of what I need to know. So I check for thyroid antibodies. I check T free T3, free T4, reverse T3. That's going to give me a much greater picture, a much clearer idea of what's happening with your thyroid. Um, and which can have a huge impact on your health. Um, and then I do stool testing and urine testing. The stool testing looks at the integrity of your microbiome. If your microbiome is off kilter and you have poor digestive enzyme output, you will struggle to absorb your nutrients. Um, and you can also struggle to detox estrogen from the gut wall. So I really do a comprehensive check, make sure that your gut is in balance. And then I also do a Dutch test, which is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. So um, it is as effective as a serum uh, blood test, but I like the Dutch because it tests, it's like time-lapse photography, like a blood test will tell me what your hormones are that minute in your body. But the Dutch test tests over, you know, you start at 5 p.m., 10 p.m. overnight, then you do uh, upon arising and two hours later. So it's a much longer window of testing and it looks at your hormone metabolites. It tells me your full cortisol curve and it will also look at the neurotransmitters in your brain to see if you're deficient in glutathione, melatonin production, B vitamins. So I really, between those three tests, I have a really comprehensive picture of what is going on and then if it tells me also, the Dutch tells me if you're a candidate for hormone replenishment, what your methylation pathways look like, so that if you do hormone replenishment, A, you should be testing your blood six to eight weeks after you start to make sure you're fully at saturation um, of your tissues. But then I like to redo the Dutch also uh, to just see, make sure that you're, everything's going down the right pathways, everything's copacetic. 
And I I love that because it's like the, you know, so many women do not know where to turn, where to go, what kind of tests they should even be taking. And if you're just going somewhere general, they're not going to have all the information that Esther has. How could somebody work with you, get your book and reach you on social media? Yeah. So see you later. Ovulators could be available at bookstores at Amazon. Um, 10-4 is the release date. And you can follow me on Instagram at gorgeous Esther. You can go to my website. I have lots of free goodies there. Estherblum.com. Get on my mailing list. We're going to have giveaways and a lot of fun stuff with the release of the book. And um, I have an application there to work with me. So um thank you thank you thank you so much for having me on today Linda. this was great it was so great to have you on and you guys will have to go back and check out our previous episode i'll leave the episode in the show notes and um esther is just a wealth of information we talked a lot about leaky gut and some other things last time so both episodes were fabulous i love having you on and uh, much, 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 much success with your book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And have a great day. And everybody make sure you get Esther's book and let us know what resonated with you today and what you learned. Uh, Tag us on social media at Sisterhood of Sweat. And what is yours? Uh, I am gorgeous Esther on Instagram, but if you just type in Esther Blum, you'll, I'll pop up. You'll see. And make sure to follow Esther. Thanks everybody. Thank you. As always, keep on keeping on. Bye.